Wonderful. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our second virtual Croatian extravaganza. It's not quite as much of an extravaganza as it is, of course, in person, but due to the circumstances of the pandemic, we weren't sure we'd be able to throw the right kind of party. So hopefully this is the last time we'll have to do this. I'm absolutely thrilled, though, that we have the technology to be able to come to you and have you come to us. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. We'll start off with our usual songs. Um, and then our marketing manager thought it'd be a wonderful idea if I actually demonstrated how to make Chivaptici. So we'll do that later. But for now, I'm going to start with the Croatian national anthem. And for those of you who are Croatian, please feel free to sing along because I cannot. And usually we have my cousin Ivo Yeramas' beautiful and talented daughter Tanya Yeramas sing God Bless America. She's not able to do that this year, so you'll have to bear with my accordion playing yet again. And now, before I introduce my father, Milenko Mike Gergic, who is all of 98 years old now, I would like to introduce him with his favorite American song, which is You Are My Sunshine. <laughs> Release Club members, I am so happy to see so many of you to be participate in this uh, this year celebration of the Fourth of July. As you know, Fourth of July is the day when we start the binary, and that is twice as important for us, and particularly is important that there are so many of you present today, and let us celebrate 4th of July. Hi, I'm Austin Hills, co-founder of Gurgit Hill Cellar. I'd like to uh, welcome you all here to our virtual 
4th of July celebration. I hope you all enjoy it. The winery was started 43 years ago in 1977, and we've been trying to make the best wines possible in the Napa Valley. Uh, I hope you enjoy being with your family and friends for this event and have a wonderful time. Thank you so much for joining our virtual event and best wishes to you. Bye. Hello everybody, I'm here in my kitchen and uh, I have to admit something. Um, when we asked for the recipe for Chivapcici from the Croatians who always made it for us, he gave me the exact recipe and he said, do not add anything else other than this. If you do, it will ruin everything. And so he said, don't add onions, don't add paprika, don't add any of that stuff. So after we put the recipe in writing, and uh, then uh, the next year they came with their batch of chivaptici, I noticed that they not only had put onions, but also a lot of paprika in it. So I decided to add a bit of variation, which I think is more traditional, which is grated onions. So this, I think Ray, Megan might have sent this to you ahead of time, but pretty much I grated an onion. And what that does is it makes it soft and mushy, brings out a lot of the liquid, which is actually quite essential. So here I have, and actually I'm going to move my pot and get it cooking because I'm making two things at once. Uh, let's see, that one is here. There we go, all right. So here I have a combination of half beef and half ground pork. And this is traditional. You can also add a third uh, lamb. So in that, that case, you need a third lamb, a third pork, and a third beef. And I've cut up all the ingredients. I've already grated the onion. Um, everything is pretty easy. Salt, pepper, and then the garlic I'm waiting for the last minute because I want to puree that into this. So I'm just going to go ahead. And the recipe calls for about four to six cloves. Because I'm Croatian, I like to use six plus. So I'm just going to start a little bit of salt here, pepper in here. It's about a teaspoon of each. And then the garlic. I just have a knife handy with the garlic piece. So I just squeeze this right into here. So one. Not as fast as about two. Two. Three. Four. Six. All right, and just an extra one for extra measure because I'm Croatian. All right, I'll scrape everything off like this. All right, and next I have the grated onion. And I'm actually going to measure out the sparkling water. This is actually a very key ingredient, and it has to be sparkling. It makes a difference. There we go. All right. So first of all, you mix all this up very gently. The idea is to do it as gently as possible and to mix it thoroughly without really breaking the meat up too much. So you want to be very gentle with it. And the pork is a very different texture and uh, uh, visual than the beef. So you'll really have a good idea of when it's actually mixed up. Sometimes I squeeze it gently through the fingers. The recipe also calls for refrigerating a minimum of two hours or overnight. Now, I will confess that the first time I made Chivapcici was last weekend because I was so spoiled having the Croatians make it for me, so I wanted to make sure I was doing it right. I actually did not refrigerate for the recommended amount of time, and they not only looked, but tasted completely different. I had a small batch I left for the next night, 
And when I actually cooked those up, they were absolutely perfect. So the refrigeration is key. All right, this is looking pretty good right now. It looks pretty mixed up, but not too much so. So now I'm gonna add in the sparkling water. Well, I think it gives it a little bit of air. It completely changed the texture. If you guys are doing this along with me, you'll notice sort of, um, gosh, a sort of fluffiness to the, um, to the texture. I think it helps bind everything else together. So besides the um, carbonation that's in the sparkling water, this actually has a really amazing, I don't know if you can see this, it's sort of, it's completely transformed textures. It's sort of jiggly and soft and um, smells absolutely delicious. So I think, I think that's about it. Okay, let me go ahead and wipe my hands. And then this goes in the fridge. I would actually recommend overnight if you can, but definitely a minimum of two hours. So I have another batch here that I've had overnight. And I'm gonna open this up and show you how to form them but in the meantime, I'm gonna start cooking the blitva. So blitva is the Croatian word for Swiss chard. And it's a staple, especially in the Dalmatian coast, which is the area that my family comes from. And the idea is to essentially mix blitva and potatoes, cook them together and throw on tons of olive oil and usually a little bit of garlic too. Doesn't matter really how much you add in, the proportions are not as important. Uh, it's one of those things that you throw together they can be more cooked or less cooked. Either way, they always turn out well. So let me wash my hands first. Say hi to Mike. Hi, Mike. <laughs> He's peeking from outside the window here. All right, so by now I started boiling water, and I'll show you the ingredients that I have here right now. So the Swiss chard, what I usually do is I de-stem it, and I did that with a whole bunch. I used approximately two bunches for this, and this is about five smallish Yukon Golds. This is about the size. I'll use two big ones, sometimes more potatoes, sometimes less. It all depends on what we're feeling like. The proportions are entirely up to you. All right, so the way I destem this, I do this pretty quickly. I use a knife, a sharp knife, just sort of quickly slit down the middle like this, make sure the ends are okay. I'll do this one as well. So we always call this Croatian fast food. We usually just cook some sausages and then throw on some of this blitva and it would make an instant dinner. So cut these up into smallish pieces. And fortunately, I have not cut myself yet. All right, and then I just cut these into small pieces. Okay, I'll put that along with the rest of the stems that I destemmed earlier. Okay, so now we'll get to it. Let's see. So once the water is boiling, I've added a bit of salt to this. I don't always add salt, but either way. In they go. And so I probably want to cook these for about five minutes or so, and then I will add in the stems because they're a little bit harder. And uh, after that, the leaves. But in the meantime, I'm going to show you how to form the chivapcha chin. So this is actually really fun, and there's a pretty easy technique to do it. I take just a little bit of, maybe about this much, usually a smaller bit, and I feel how it feels in my hand. And I wanted to have my fingers touch my palm. And yet, so this one, it's not quite. So I want it sort of the length of my fingers. There we go. So this feels pretty good. I'm just barely closing my fingers on this. And it's made a beautiful little chip up. So on it goes. I don't know how many of you guys are actually cooking along with me. Uh, or I know some of you have already made it beforehand. So hopefully they turned out well. For those of you guys have made it without the onion, I'd really be interested in hearing what you thought it did, so.
the don't tell my dad there's onions and garlic in here. He doesn't like them. All right. So once you get the hang of this, this is sort of all by feeling. My mother was an amazing cook, and she taught me a lot about cooking from the time I was very young. And except for baking, most of it was really about eyeballing and smelling. It was really all about taking ingredients and putting them together in such a way that they just tasted good. The key to a lot of Croatian cooking is simplicity and using the best ingredients, especially olive oil. And it's actually much harder to cook with less ingredients than with more, because you really have to get the techniques right and to have the right quality of ingredients. So. Yeah, and the Croatian recipe, of course, says throw a bit of this together, throw a bit of that together. <laughs> and uh, because I never made it before, we had a wonderful um, local chef and cookbook writer, uh, Jill Howe. She actually uh, takes a lot of sort of home recipes and writes them down in such a way that anybody can translate them. So she worked with my mom and me to actually try to get these right. And that's how come the uh, recipe came to have actual amounts of ingredients. Okay, I'm going to make a little bit of a long one right here. Okay, beautiful. So I'm going to wash my hands, check on the potatoes, see how they're doing. Okay, let's see about these potatoes. I'm also going to turn on my skillet, which I probably should have done earlier. We'll see how it goes. Okay, potatoes are boiling away. Another way that we, you know, I'm looking at the potatoes, I can tell that they've barely started cooking. Uh, just by sort of moving them around in the pot, I can tell they're pretty hard. So I'm gonna give these guys another minute or so before I throw in the stems. And let's see, in the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to toast to all of you. I don't know if you've opened your wine already. I know my cousin Evo is on standby. He's going to tell you all about the wonderful wines. But I'm starting off with our Fumé Blanc, which we've actually, with this 2018 vintage, we made a slight label change. For those of us old fogies, we remember Fumé Blanc as the wine that Robert Mondavi invented and that my father first made for him. But younger people are now starting to really not understand that Fumé Blanc is actually Sauvignon Blanc. And so we made a little bit of a label change. Just switch the two of those together. And I think everybody is happy now. We still retain the Fumé Blanc, same wine, same style, and just a label that I think everybody can understand. So for those of you who are Croatian or not, or have been around for a while, you know that when we say cheers, we say Zivili. So I like to say Zivili to all of you. Happy 4th of July and enjoy. Let me see how this tastes. Delicious. This is our breakfast wine, by the way. We call it this way because it wakes up your taste buds and gets everything going. It also goes with absolutely everything. All right, so let me go check on the potatoes. Looking pretty good. Okay, looking a little more tender, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna put the stems in now. If you are lucky enough to have your own garden, and you have your own Swiss chard, it will probably be much more tender, uh, the stems, than if you buy it in the store. So really, all of this is playing this by ear. I always time the rest of uh, the leaf, leafy part, basically depending on what I'm cooking. Sometimes the potatoes turn out to be um, more like, a, what do you call it, potato salad, so they're more formed. Sometimes they're more mashy, sometimes they're right in between. Really depends on what you like. I suggest you try them always because they are all good. I'm going to give it another minute. In the meantime, I'm going to pull out ciabatta chi that have been. In the fridge for a while. Transfer this back to the fridge. So these have actually been here for two hours in the refrigerator. 
And I believe actually the sparkling water makes a great deal, a lot to the texture when it's forming and also when it cools the meat. So whatever it is, it's a magic ingredient and it works. So I'm gonna put these off to the side here. I'm waiting for my pan to heat up. Take a look at. This is cooking pretty nicely. I'm going to give it another minute. And in the meantime, I'm going to try to do two things at once. I'm going to add a little bit of oil. I don't use olive oil when I cook things. I usually eat, use grapeseed oil or peanut oil. Or, so I'm just going to do a little bit of oil. Actually, that's too much. I'm actually going to there we go so that way it's nicely greased up but not too much oil and I'm going to go ahead and start adding the rocket chip my husband's usually the one that grills meat in the house and so rather than play this by ear once I get all these guys on I'm actually going to time it for about two minutes. Let's see. Start. Two minutes. All right. Get this out of the way. about time to put in the leaves. So I'm just going to plop them right on top. Push them down a bit. And then even though I usually eyeball it, I'm going to set a timer here for five minutes. And I'm going to put this in the sink because we're going to drain it after it's done. All right, so I'm going to be patient and not touch these guys. They're going to be about brown on one side, then I'm going to do another two minutes on the other side and then do them a little bit all over. And actually, is this a good time to introduce Eva for the wines? I think now I'd like to introduce my cousin, Eva Yadamas, and he can talk about the wines that we're having today. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, it is obvious that uh, from now on, Violet will be in charge of making uh, Cervapci for all of us uh, for our uh, extravaganza. Uh, my, my job today is to talk about these four wines that uh, you are tasting today. Uh, but before I go there, I want to talk about something that is of, of crucial importance for producing top quality wines, which is uh, how you farm. You all know that we are, we have been for the last 20 years a state winery, uh, meaning that everything you purchase from us uh, comes from our own grapes. So, so farming is the most important part of our business. Many wineries today are run by very smart CFO, CEOs, uh, but they don't know anything about farming. Unless you know intimately about farming, it's hard to make top quality wines. We are Europeans and that's how it's been done in Europe for, for generations. So we are lucky to have five state vineyards from American Canyon, Carneros, uh, through Yantville, Rutherford and Calistoga, totaling 365 hectares. Not only that we own our own land and farm it, but uh, how you farm, as I already mentioned, is crucial. So we never like chemicals. And for us, the 20 years or so, we've been uh, certified organic. Then uh, recently, in 2019, we started a farming called regenerative farming, 
you, as you know, probably last 100 or 150 years, farming has been degenerative, meaning we are destroying our soil, destroying microbes in our soil. And so regenerative farming is system of farming that will recharge our soil, that our soil will become alive again, meaning that microbes will be there. As a creator uh, intended, nature works best when it's undisturbed, when uh, you don't use poison, uh, when you don't use these awful herbicides and pesticides. Anywhere uh, you look around, uh, instead of competition, uh, like most people believe uh, nature is all about competition, actually plants and microbes work in synergistic effect. They need each other. So what we do at Gurgic Hills, uh, we did not invent. We are just copying what, what worked fine for millions of years in Asia. So today our farming is based on so-called no-till. So we are not cultivating soil, which is basically removing carbon from soil and disturbing microbes, especially fungi. So we, we plant cover crop uh, in October and during rainy season, we have a huge uh, cover crop and then we bring sheep. That's a second aspect of our farming that we haven't done before. So we are involving livestock in our vineyards, which produces most fertile soil full of microbes. Uh, when you do this, uh, uh, you, when you don't till soil, you protect soil from exposure to this incredible heat that we're having. Uh, soil bakes at uh, this heat and water evaporates. So contrary to common belief that you till soil to preserve moisture because you want to eliminate any weed, any grass, thinking that that grass will reduce uh, or, or suck some water from the soil and they won't be going to your grapevines. It's actually contrary to the, uh, contrary is true. Uh, you preserve water far more when you don't till soil and you have cover um, a little mulch on the top of your soil, so soil doesn't get to 150 degrees. So, uh, as you can see, I'm very passionate about farming, uh, and uh, for a variety of reasons, I believe uh, with this kind of farming, we can truly produce authentic wine, and that's our goal at Gilbert Shields, to produce authentic wines. That they all are different, every vintage is different, uh, and uh, they are not uh, like Coca Cola, uh, like uh, alcoholic beverage that you drink uh, without thinking. So, our wines are pieces of art, and the reason for that is not that that came from winemaker's head, the reason for that is how we farm. So, today uh, we will uh, introduce to you four wines. First one is uh, Sauvignon Blanc 2018. Violet already mentioned that we uh, slightly changed the font of uh, our label. Uh, so most people today are confused with names. So we put Sauvignon Blanc in more prominent letters so that you know that it's a Sauvignon Blanc variety, but it's Fumé Blanc. Not that Fumé Blanc is a, a special style, but more like to respect Mike Gergic and Robert Mordavi who popularized this uh, name. It's a part of our tradition. So 2018 vintage was uh, bountiful. Uh, we have lots of grapes uh, and it was cooler. So not every vintage uh, in Napa Valley is hot. 17 was hot, 20 was hot, 18, 19 were cooler vintages. I personally like cooler vintages, especially for whites because you always have more refreshing acidic wines uh, that are to my liking, hopefully you like it. So there's more acidity here. Our Sauvignon Blanc, um, um, besides having nice perfume, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, unlike Chardonnay, is aromatic grape. So you want to capture those nice, uh, nice aromatics. Also has beautiful texture. The reason for that uh, are multiple. First, we, once we crush grapes, we do not use commercial yeast. Uh, we there's a plenty yeast, native yeast on our grapes. So all our wines are made with so-called wild or native yeast, which uh, we are talking hundreds of different species and, and strains of yeast, uh, which always co make complete, co more complete wine, also more unique to that vineyard because every vineyard has a different biome, microbiome, and uh, that gives you a little bit of different distinction from other vineyards and around other vintage. 
secondly, after uh, we ferment this Sauvignon Blanc uh, juice, uh, overwhelmingly in fooders, they are 900 or 1500 gallons big French oak barrels, but uh, obviously oversized barrels. We age Sauvignon Blanc on so-called surly. It's a French term for aging white wine on its own sediment, overwhelmingly dead yeast. This process immensely improves texture. So our wine has uh, nice aromatics, nice crispness for acid. And then when you put it in the mouth and there's a heaviness, there's a, this wonderful texture, almost like when you put butter on broccoli. Uh, so that's uh, our trademark of Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc, as you see, is 2018 vintage. Many people that don't know much about wine believe the Sauvignon Blanc has expiration date as a yogurt. That's a nonsense. If you make great Sauvignon Blanc, uh, actually probably if you keep it in bottle a few years, you'll be better off because that uh, the wine needs a bit of time for all flavors to marry into unified voice, which we call bouquet. Uh, so we, uh, we age Sauvignon Blanc on its lease for six to eight months. We bottle it and then year, year and a half in bottle before release. So it's a perfect uh, wine uh, to start uh, your meal. Uh, due to higher acidity, it will open your, your buds and goes well with all kinds of seafood uh, uh, and even, even uh, chicken. So I many times I grab Sauvignon Blanc before I grab Chardonnay, especially on a warm summer day. So next wine that we have is uh, uh, Chardonnay 2018, same vintage. This one is Milenko selection. So we, as you know, as, as our club members, we have three Chardonnays, Napa Valley, Milenko selection, and uh, commemorative Paris tasting. For my palate, and we're all different, I like this one because it's most elegant. It's uh, most restrained. Uh, for some people, maybe lean, but I love that leanness. Uh, so we, uh, we select special clones uh, from, uh, from Carneros, mostly Carneros, that uh, one major one is so-called Old Venti clone, uh, which, which has very small clusters and intensely flavored grapes. Uh, overwhelmingly, we ferment uh, and age uh, this Chardonnay in fooders, so no influence of uh, new oak. The result is wine with, uh, again, uh, Restraint, great structure, which comes from high acidity. And then also there's a pronounced sense of minerality, which is important. Uh, I would say something that you probably are uh, wondering where that comes from is salinity. Just like uh, when you cook meat or food, you always have to put some salt to bring flavors. So when you have salinity in wine, that enhances also flavor, how wine tastes. Uh, so, all these things are combined, uh, acidity, minerality, and salinity. And uh, for many, many decades, French would try to convince anybody that minerality can be only achieved uh, in, in Burgundy. That's not true. I think minerality is achieved through organic farming. So Chardonnay uh, is en Sauvignon Blanc. We pick grapes at night. Uh, they are brought early in the morning to the winery uh, and pressed, uh, whole casa pressed. Chardonnay goes 80% to, to French uh, barrels. They are 60 gallons. We only use the 25 to 30% to, uh, new oak. In this case, as I said, that this is overwhelmingly, uh, this wine was done in uh, fooders. So this wine, uh, you won't smell any, any openness in this wine. So after fermentation is over, we keep uh, uh, for a year this wine on Surly. And then uh, typically uh, we rack it and then it's kept another six months in same fooder and bottle typically in December. So six months after we bottle Napa Valley. Uh, minimum age a year in a barrel and the wine is released. So for me, uh, this Chardonnay is most elegant from our tree. Uh, many people love Paris tasting, which is much rounder, more buttery kind of, and uh, many people love that style, but uh, that I, I personally prefer this style. Uh, next to wine is very special uh, to our family uh, is Zinfandel 2016. Uh, Zinfandel, as you all know, is finally proven that uh, came from Croatia. Originally, uh, when they discovered, uh, I think only 70, 18 plants, they did DNA. It was identical to Zinfandel that we have here in California. 
uh, it was called Tsarlyanak. But then after a few years, when they dug uh, historical data, they found out that the first known name was Tribidrag, and it goes back over 400 years ago. So it's a very noble uh, variety that uh, is being successfully grown in Croatia for many, many centuries. Uh, Mike Gergic, when he came to the United States, uh, and so first vineyard, he was Zimhodel, he thought that he never left Croatia, he thought that he's dreaming, and, uh, and he was sure that uh, this is got to be Croatian variety. So he was almost 100% right, but uh, it turns out that we, what, what we grow today in Croatia called Plavac Mali, which incidentally we make now in Croatia, it's offspring of original Zimhodel. So Zimhodel and, and uh, or Crljenak and something uh, else, uh, white variety called Dobricic cross pollinated and new grape variety Plavac Mali was, was created in Croatia maybe 150 years ago. Quickly, uh, this new variety Plavac Mali, it has proven to be prolific uh, producer. It was producing two, three times more crop which those days that was all uh, what was uh, needed more, more, more grapes, and so best, basically this new variety took over, and uh, Selenak all but disappeared. That's why it took so many years to find those 17 or 19 plants uh, that uh, that uh, so for proof that Zin uh, is originally from Croatia. Our Zinfandel is uh, grown in Kalistoga, where Mike lives. We have a beautiful range there, maybe more, more most picturesque vineyard. Reminds Mike uh, at his uh, village uh, with a San Helena background, uh, which is very similar to to so-called Babina Gomila, the, the little uh, mountain in uh, his village. Uh, soil is similar. It's uh, all rolling hills uh, from 800 uh, feet elevation to 300. Uh, soil is reddish, su suggesting there's lots of iron in soil. It's a very similar soil that we have in Croatia and Dalmatia coast. So uh, if you want very elegant reds, uh, Zimhodel is hardest variety to make low alcohol, organic, uh, low alcohol, elegant uh, red wine. Zimhodel has huge clusters, huge berries. Uh, and uh, when you grow uh, grapes in Kalistoga, Many times uh, you get 100, 510 degrees. One day you had the nice uh, sugar levels that will produce maybe 14% alcohol. Two, three days after with this heat, uh, heat spell and low humidity, uh, water evaporates and you have raisins. All of a sudden, if you make pick grapes and make wine, you'll have 17, 18% uh, alcohol, which we try to avoid. So, we try our best to pick uh, ripe grapes, but not overripe. So our alcohol is typically is about 15% or low or high 14s, which is relatively low for Zimondal. So Zimondal is probably most universal uh, red wine. Uh, it, can, it goes well with so many uh, dishes, uh, including chicken, including fish. In Croatia, where we, we were uh, born, uh, we drink overwhelmingly red wine with everything. And so this wine is light. Uh, why I'd like to say that uh, uh, Zinfandel uh, is very, our Zinfandel is similar to Pinot in terms of, uh, there's lots of fresh, uh, fresh uh, fruit there. Uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's, there's this refreshment and youthfulness in um, our Zinfandel. We also like to age Zinfandel, so 16 vintage reflects that. Uh, the wine um, uh, can uh, be enjoyed now, but uh, all our whites and reds, uh, as you know, uh, can age gracefully for many, many decades. And that's why we have extensive, uh, uh, we have extensive uh, uh, library selections. The Zinfandel uh, is, uh, when it's uh, ripe, we pick it, distem it, it's fermented for maybe 12 to, to 14 days in stainless steel. Uh, only stems are removed. Uh, and then uh, wine goes to uh, barrels, French oak barrels, but uh, Overwhelmingly used barrels. We don't use uh, new French oak uh, for Zinfandel because Zinfandel, unlike Cabernet, uh, has much more delicate tannin structure. We want tannins to come from grapes, not from oak. O oak can impart lots of oaky tannins, and that then the wine looks awkward. So we are very careful uh, not to put uh, our Zinfandel in new French oak. 
about uh, 18 months of uh, barrel aging with bottled wine and uh, it's bottled aged for about two years before releasing. And our last wine tonight is a very special one, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon 17 vintage, uh, also Mianco selection. Just as a Chardonnay, we have three Cabernets. We have Napa Valley, we have uh, Milenko Selection, which is 100% from our Rutherford vineyard right around the winery in Rutherford, which is prime land for Cabernet. And then we have Yanko Selection, which is our, uh, obviously, top, top quality Cabernet from our oldest 61-year-old uh, vineyard in uh, Yantville. So today you are tasting uh, uh, Milenko Selection, Rutherford Cabernet 2017. Unlike 2018 vintage, which uh, was modest in rain, but very cool, 17 was one of difficult vintages. We have tremendous rainfall, uh, 50, 60 inches of rain early on, and then uh, intense heat. We had six heat events. Uh, for me, heat event is temperature about 110 degrees. And uh, comparing that with 2018, we had zero. So you can see a huge difference in, in uh, uh, climatic conditions between two vintages. Many people say that in California, we have a predictable even uh, Mediterranean weather climate, especially during summer and the vintages are similar. That's not true. In maybe, uh, in old days in France, uh, it was a rain, especially during harvest that ruined vintages and the best vintages were ones with no rain during harvest. In California, we never had rain that will ruin our harvest, but we do have heat events. So for us, how much rain we get in each winter uh, and how much heat we have during summer determines what kind of vintage we have. So this 2017 is definitely was forged in fire, literally, as you know, we had uh, some fire or not some fires, uh, quite serious fires in 2017. Uh, so wine, the, the grapes uh, were uh, thick, skins were very thick due to this ex excessive heat. What saved this vintage is we had incredible amount of moisture in soil. So it could have been much worse uh, uh, considering how hot that, that vintage was. Resulting wines are a bit tonic. Uh, so I believe this vintage will need even a bit more patience and aging. Wine is uh, uh, ready to be uh, enjoyed today. Uh, I would not recommend that you drink a glass or two before meal, but with any kind of uh, red meat steak, uh, it will be a wonderful companion because as you know uh, the red wine especially Cabernet has firm nice structure which is called tannins then your steak has nice proteins so when you uh, eat uh, steak and drink uh, this Cabernet these two components will bind into very pleasurable uh, and leave very pleasurable uh, taste so this is uh, that's the art of creating wine that will pair well with uh, with food uh, so 2017 and any other vintage, uh, we, uh, we picked uh, ripe, not overripe. We don't like raisin grapes, uh, so we pick ripe Cabernet. Uh, we distemmed them. Uh, the Cabernet is fermented uh, up to three weeks in uh, uh, stainless steel. And now with lower temperature, maybe only 80 degrees uh, total temperature, uh, high temperature of fermentation. Uh, in old days, we try to go to 90 degrees to get more, more, more. but. Uh, uh, when uh, you are trying to get more, you get more of good stuff, also more and bad stuff. We are, we have been always known for making very elegant uh, and uh, drinkable wine, uh, but as of late, we are trying to even fine tune it even more. We want to uh, capture that essence of Napa Valley, which for us, it's not very ripe uh, and high alcoholic Cabernet. And uh, there is people that are very successful uh, for, with that kind of style, and uh, you might even have to pay, pay three times more money. So, uh, for there's many different people liking different styles, and I believe our style, uh, you are t t you, our customers, are proof that uh, you like what we what we try to achieve at the Gergit Hills. So, so wine uh, after uh, alcoholic fermentation, uh, the Cabernet goes to French oak barrels, about uh, 40 to 50 percent new. Why? more new oak here in Cabernet versus Chardonnay because Cabernet has much more structure and can easily handle uh, new oak. And you will never notice oak in our, any of our wines, even if you put more than 50%. So oak is a supporting cast. 
uh, oak barrel is like cradle. When uh, when your your kid is born, you put it in a crib. So we consider um, uh, oak barrel almost like crib for our wines. So we like to say that uh, we don't make wines; we raise the wines. Uh, very very much same, uh, uh, similar to what uh, how you raise your your kids. So after uh, wines are put in barrels, uh, they are aged. Uh, the Cabernet is aged about 22 months, uh, pulled out and bottled, uh, typically in July, uh, August, uh, minimum uh, year, year and a half of bottle aging, and wine is ready to be consumed. Uh, with the Cabernet more than any other variety due to massive structure, we have a policy of leaving uh, 10 to 15 percent of our production behind. Then 10 years typically after harvest, we release those Cabernets. We built special warehouse in 2009, 2010, to, 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 so we can keep properly these wines. We have uh, uh, AC and the generator. So now with all these PG&E problems, uh, you obviously, you have to have uh, electricity always available uh, because those wines are always kept. We keep our thermostat at 56 degrees. So these wines are properly stored. And then the result is amazing. There's a now huge demand for these uh, library selections. Uh, very few, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not aware of any other wine in Napa Valley that will uh, leave so much wine behind. Many people leave a hundred cases uh, so that can do, they can do tastings for many years to come. But I am not sure that anybody is leaving commercial amounts to resell after 10 years. Yes, it's a risky uh, to do that. Uh, wine is perishable, but we believe uh, in a really, uh, we are very happy what happens to Cabernet uh, after 10 years. And I would not say that uh, it's twice as good as a four-year-old Cabernet, it's different. And many people, uh, lots of people like that aged Cabernet, so, so we have it. So that uh, concludes my uh, uh, presentation about wines and farming. Uh, later on, if there's any questions uh, after Violet uh, kind of uh, is done with cooking, we can, uh, I can answer any questions. And once again, I thank you for uh, your support. You are most important part of our business. Without you, there wouldn't be garbage shows. And we always like to say, uh, you keep drinking, we'll keep making great wines. We promise you that. Thank you, Violet, back to you. Hello everybody. So in the meantime, while Ivo has been telling you about our wonderful wines, I finished cooking the ciabatta chip. Right. Is... Okay. Hello everybody. So while Ivo has been telling you about our wonderful wines and farming, I finished the ciabatta chip. I ended up cooking them about two to three minutes on, on each side. And I do not flip them. I made the mistake the first time I made them. I try to flip them right away. You need to actually wait at least two minutes for them to get a nice, wonderful uh, brown crust on them. Then another two minutes on the other side, and then side by side so they were thoroughly covered. So let me bring these out and show you what they actually look like. It looks pretty darn good and it smells amazing. So I'm gonna put this back on the stove to heat up and I'll show you what I do with the bleep fun. So after I ended up draining it, this is pretty much what it looks like in the pot. This is gonna be a little more on the mushy style, a little more like mashed potatoes. Um, as you probably noticed, I kept the skins on. I'm a great fan of potato skins. So you can peel them, you can keep them on, you can do whatever you like. Um, when, the, um, when you start seeing cracks in the potatoes as they're cooking and they feel softer when you move your spoon around, uh, they're gonna be a little more on the mashed potato side. If they're still a little firm before the skin starts to peel away, they're gonna be a little bit more firm, more like potato salad. Either way is great. Big, very important thing to do is you actually drain it. So you wanna put it in the sink and you let it drain. It's still continuing to drain here. Let me clean this up a little bit um, because the less water you have in it, the better it's going to be. So in the meantime, I'm gonna make uh, what my husband calls Croatian sauce. So once we started uh, dating each other, my husband was horrified to find out that I would put uh, a combination of olive oil and garlic on my steak. He thought it was dreadful. And so he started calling it Croatian sauce. And then he soon found out from my mother and me that we pretty much put it all over everything. So pretty much olive oil. And you'll notice that this olive oil is pretty yellow. I like my olive oil to actually smell and taste like olives, to have a very rich, full flavor. 
Um, there's a lot of oils now that are very grassy, very peppery. Um, I have a very sensitive palate and I can only use a very tiny amount of that on very special occasions. But for the most part, I will use something like this and I'll use it by the gallon on just about everything. So Croatian sauce, very easy. Get your handy dandy garlic press for about this amount. And this does not keep. The next day it's not going to be the same. So you want to make it fresh every day. Pretty much this amount. I think one clove of garlic is probably okay. Let's see what it looks like. I'm going to scrape that in. That's not enough. Never enough garlic. Let's do two more of these. And what's really wonderful about this is you can actually put this in your blitva if you like, and it'll give it a wonderful flavor. You can either put just the oil or you can put a combination of them. Okay, is that good? Ah, let me do one more. Why not? Can't let good garlic go to waste. Okay. All right, there we go. And I like using a garlic press that essentially squeezes the juice out of them. A lot of the ones that I found these days actually don't do that. They just sort of mince them and then you don't have that benefit of that glorious juice. That's one of the reasons you grate the onion for the chibachichi is because it's so soft and all of that beautiful juice permeates the meat and gives it incredible flavor. Okay, I'm gonna put that to the side and I'm gonna stir this up a bit. Yep, this looks pretty darn good. that to the side and I'll let that sit. So Litva, uh, here is, it's still hot by the way, it keeps, potatoes keep their temperature very well. So I'm just going to drop this in a nice big pot. And this is the fun part where I eyeball things. So first of all, I put a lot of olive oil. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. So I have no idea how much olive oil but I know I started off with a full container. So I want to make it nice. Okay, let's see how much that's. So I used about this much. By the way, this is, this is not Gurga Chills olive oil. This is for very delicate, small applications, not these massive applications. So I'm going to see how that is. I'm going to start mixing it up. Actually, this is not going to be as mushy as I thought it was going to be. Olive oil smells great. It smells just like olives. Okay, so you're starting to see the potatoes get a little bit more mushy. I'm actually going to add a little bit more olive oil because you can't have too much. And then I'm going to start with, let's use my pepper. Let's see, my husband actually ground a whole bunch, so I'm just going to put a whole bunch of pepper. I'm not sure how much that is. I don't think it's a teaspoon. I have no idea. And so I have this little tiny, I think this might be an eighth of a teaspoon. And I tend to use this as my measuring for salt because I hate too much salt. I always under salt rather than over salt. You can always add more, you can't take it away. So I'm gonna start, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, I'm probably gonna end up putting 10, just seeing from the amount. Stir it up a little bit more. Nice thing with the pepper is it gives you an idea of how much you've stirred it. This is actually looking exactly the way I wanted to. I'm actually rather shocked because usually when you try to demonstrate something, it comes out not quite the right way. All right, I'm going to add five more. And I'm not seeing very much pepper, so I'm going to add just a little bit more. Now, usually when I make this and I have Croatian sauce, I just keep the Croatian sauce on the side. That way you can add as much or as little as you like. So this is turning into a bit of a mush and this is exactly the way it's supposed to look. You've got big potato chunks and you have this beautiful, smooth, glossy. That's all from that olive oil being mixed into it. So I'm thinking that this is probably done. I'm not gonna try it because I don't do that. And I'm just going to put a little bit on my plate to see if I got it right. And I'm going to take one 
Oh, that is beautiful. Shivachichi. Okay. This back. It's keeping warm. Now, traditionally, for those of you who've been coming to our parties, I think maybe one or two parties, some of the Croatians bought, brought Ivar. Ivar is a traditional um, condiment that goes along with chivapchichi and all kinds of other meats. It's made with roasted bell peppers, uh, red bell peppers, and eggplant, as well as garlic, maybe some onion too. And they're all roasted and then mixed in. So you can actually buy it anywhere. It is uh, A-J-V-A-R is Oh, this is Iver. This is Makedonski. Uh-oh, that's okay. A-J-A-V-A-R. So I've got a hot one, I've got a mild one, and I've got the chivap here. So I'm gonna actually try a little bit of the hot stuff, but first I'm gonna try, try this and see how it is. Oh! Mmm. Wow, it tastes exactly like I remember. Okay, and of course I have to have some Croatian sauce on it little tiny bit. Let's see how that is. Now the idea for these is to not be overcooked. They should be still soft and juicy. Mm. Okay, that's good. Now let's see how my blueprint turned out. I think I got it right. Wonderful. Well, there you go. I hope you have enjoyed everything today. And I wanted to thank all of you, especially. I know it's a lot of time for you to be spending on a holiday weekend. We really miss having you at the winery. We miss having our wonderful festival, our Croatian dancers, our roast lambs and piglets, and of course the Chivapcici. But most important, we miss you because you are what has kept us going all these many years. And without your support, we would not be here today. So I wanna say a big thank you to all of you and I will hope to see you in person next year or even at the winery. If some of you guys come and visit, we'd love to see you. So I have my Zinfandel. And I'll raise my glass to you and say, Jivali. Thank you so much. And I wanted to introduce you to our wine club manager, Aviva Brazo. As always, we have a special for you and hope that you will enjoy it. Aviva, take it away. Thank you so much, Violet. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. We very much appreciate everyone that was here today. And um, yeah, we do know that everybody uh, had a plans for the uh, holiday weekend and we're so happy that you chose to choose some of that uh, time with us. Um, we do have a special... The Valley Merlot, Malenko Selection Cabernet, and uh, the Yantville Cabernet, and uh, the Malenko Selection Chardonnay. Um, we have a wonderful special uh, of about 30% off on those wines today. And if you buy 24 of um, a mix of 24 of any of those bottles, you can get the Napa Valley Fume Blanc for $99.
um, just give Lauren and I a shout out or email to wineclub at gergich.com and we will be very happy to assist you with that. Or just give us a call at 707-963-2784 and Lauren and or I will be very happy to help you with any orders that you may have. If anybody has anybody any questions, I'm very happy to open this up to any questions and uh, into the chat or just raise your hand. Uh, we've got uh, oh we've got Lisa letting us know that she loves the Croatia sauce, and uh, Greg and Joanne are saying thank you to the Gergich family. And uh, do we have any other questions out there? Okay, yeah, I have a question oh. for Evo, if I might. So uh, mm -hmm. this is Pat St. Pierre. So uh, Evo, I enjoyed the discussion about Fumé Blanc. And uh, when the word Fumé from France, you know, refers mostly to Pouli Fumé and uh, the smokiness that they get with the Sauvignon Blanc from the soils and the flinty smoky character. And, uh, and they don't necessarily uh, oak their Sauvignon Blanc to get that. So can you comment on how you get the smokiness? Because do you think with the microbes and the farming that you can get some of that flinty, smoky minerality? Or is it a terroir driven type of thing? And that for that, we can't do it unless we uh, use the oak to get the smokiness. Even though it's not overly smoky, I understand. Excellent question. Uh, I do believe that uh, Sauvignon Blanc variety has inherent capacity to produce that, but uh, you have to grow grapes naturally so the roots go deep down where there's uh, less fertility and more minerals. Uh, so smokiness, uh, I believe it's related to flintiness or gunpowder, that kind of smoke. Like when, you, when you strike uh, strike flint, there is smoke and many people uh, believe that's what you find in great Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, so this is totally different Sauvignon Blanc character than uh, Sauvignon Blancs for New Zealand, which uh, so-called tiles, uh, and they are very aromatic, very pungent, very powerful. But for my palate, I far prefer this flittiness uh, in the, and reduction in Sauvignon Blanc. So once again, I do believe that uh, our Sauvignon Blanc is much closer related to uh, Puy Fumé, a Sauvignon Blanc from, uh, uh, from France than New Zealand. Thanks for the question. Sorry about that. Does anybody else have any more questions? So I am putting the uh, special today in the chat window. Okay, go ahead. Did you want to take oh no, I'm sorry. I'm just reading all the comments. It's wonderful. So yes, looking forward to seeing all of you. I'm seeing uh, Dr. St. Pierre and Linda Evans, who's the mayor of La Quinta, where my dad spends the winter. Dennis McQuaid, our dear friends. Really very much look forward to seeing all of you. Um, Greg Privilisky, oh, wonderful. Nice to see you guys too. Um, wonderful. Um, and, you know, one of the things I wanted to do, uh, there's a dessert I sort of came up with based on a Croatian dessert called palacinka. Palacinka are essentially crepes. Uh, they actually use sparkling water, too. So I think that's the, the magic ingredient of some of Croatian cooking. Um, but for those of you who are interested, I'll happy to send the recipe. We'll revise the recipe with the grated onions and send that to everybody if you haven't had a chance to try it. And then essentially, just on another note, my, my little dessert that I like to do now and then, oftentimes I'll have leftover crepes palachinka in the fridge, and then uh, we'll spread them a little bit with various kinds of jam, just like scraping it on, roll them up very thinly, put them in a small baking dish and pour either half and half or whipping cream over them, then bake them about 300, 350 for, I guess whenever they're done, once the cream starts to solidify a little bit, turn a little bit golden, and it's absolutely delicious and decadent and so easy. So maybe on another time, I'll show you guys how to do that. Any other questions? For me or for Eva? Hmm. 
Okay. Ah, my grandfather left Croatia in 1900 and did not share a lot of culture with us. Thank you for filling in some culture. Maiden name is Plesha. That's wonderful. I was very lucky in that I, both of my parents were Croatian and I learned to speak Croatian first. I didn't learn English until I was two. So I was very much steeped in Croatian tradition, which I always very much loved and respected and always felt not only American, but also Croatian. And uh, like every culture, there's good things, there's bad things, but I like to take the best from everything. And for us, it's very fun to share. When my father came up with the idea of this Croatian festival, it was really a wine club festival for our most fabulous wine club members. And he wanted to bring some of that and share that Croatian culture with the roast lambs, with the um, Cevapcici, as well as with Croatian folk dancers. So we showed a clip a little bit earlier. I think uh, if there are no other questions, oh, I see I, uh, there's another question there, then we can end with that. But um, what is Eno's go-to Virgichil's wine and which is Violet's? Oh, well, I, you know, at the moment I'm drinking the Zinfandel and the Fumé Blanc. We love the Milienko Selection Chardonnay. I'd say all of the wines are wonderful. It all depends. They're, they're all so good. Um, but yeah, I'd say, you know, definitely go to a lot of the Milienko Selection Chardonnay as well as the Zinfandel. Oh. Hmm? Evo? I already stated that my love for uh, Milenko Selection Chardonnay, that's my favorite out of three. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc uh, Essence is also my favorite. A Cabernet Yantel, of course, selection. Uh, it's, we have incredible jewel in our 61 year old vineyard, which uh, is doing remarkably well, uh, especially this year, uh, despite all this uh, drought. Uh, so generally, our selection are, uh, are uh, up notch wines, not different wine making. They come from our oldest vineyards. So secret of great wine is always in farming, and uh, which brings uh, these old wines uh, to life. And uh, we try to not to pull wine vineyards years like everybody else. We believe they should last 80 years or more, and that's quality uh, will come with uh, old age. Jania? Oh, oh. If there are no more questions, then I'd love to say Dovi Jania, which is until we see you next time, and we definitely will see you next time. Um, and. Uh, We'll leave it to the Croatian folk dancers to end the program. Thank you guys also very much for being here with us and for being part of our Gurgic Hills family. That means so much to us. Thank you.